Hi everyone, uh, this is Nikhil Torskar coming to you from Chicago uh, with the Shelley story. Uh, today I have with me uh, Vijay Nalawala. Uh, he is the founder of Bipolar India and I will uh, tell you a little bit more about his background. Um, he is a commerce graduate uh, majoring in financial uh, accountancy. Uh, Vijay has been an entrepreneur for over three decades. Uh, his lived experience with bipolar disorder became the inspiration for him to extend outreach to community. Founded by Vijay in May of 2013, Bipolar India is a unique hybrid online and offline model, which now has over 600 members pan India. Vijay penned down his journey of recovery and his book, Bipolar's Journey from Torment to Fulfillment was published globally in 2015. Bipolar India has launched a pioneering initiative in August 2020 called Let's Walk Together.org. Conceptualized and founded by him, it is focused on livelihoods for persons with mental health conditions and has been supported by the finest thought leaders and organizations from the mental health and policy domain. Vijay has been invited as speaker at important seminars and conferences on mental health and has appeared on numerous webinars, podcasts, and video films. He's passionate about his fitness and loves writing, music, photography, and travel. Uh, so Vijay, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us and I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me on this platform, Nikhil. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, so I wanted to tell the audience a little bit about uh, sort of what led to this uh, conversation. Um, so as you may know, my wife Shelly and I are, uh, we've written a book uh, about our journeys uh, with mental health, uh, some of the highs and the lows. Uh, it's really intended to offer hope to people out there who are either suffering uh, from bipolar disorder or have a loved one who is suffering from uh, the illness. And it was something that because we are both of Indian origin, our parents were born in India, we grew up here. Uh, it's really something that is, I think, unique uh, when you place it in the cultural context of South Asians uh, in the United States, because we're a very successful group. You know, obviously the CEOs such as uh, the CEOs of Google and um, Twitter and uh, IBM and Microsoft. I, I know I forgot. Um, there's so many successful Indians, uh, entrepreneurs out there who are really making strides. And uh, there's always there's always two sides of the coin and one of those would be sort of the um, little bit of a stigmatization of mental health and being a model minor being part of that model minority myth there's really compunction to keep your head down and achieve and just focus on the task at hand and any sort of need for self-care or mental you know attending to mental illness is sort of seen as a weakness and so um Shelly and I, that's our mission really with this book and these podcasts is to eradicate that stigma and foster some open dialogue. And so that's why uh, our another part of our journey is not just looking at the way mental health is handled here in the U.S., uh, but sort of going to the root, uh, going to the, to, the, to the motherland, if you will, uh, in India. And so we were very fortunate to cross paths with uh, Mr. Nalawala who is the founder of Bipolar India. Uh, so we reached out to him uh, to see if he'd be interested in talking to us about his journey. And uh, he graciously agreed. So uh, Vijay, I, I wanted to thank you again. My pleasure, Nikhil. Thanks. So uh, Vijay, yeah, if you can uh, tell us a little bit more about your story, I mean, I think I gave uh, the viewers and the listeners the broad strokes, but if there's more you want to tell us about, you know, how you, became you know how, how what what was your entry point into the world of mental health and sort of how it's evolved since then if you could uh, shed some light on that certainly nickel uh, i would say my journey was more about floundering on the path to discovery in the first place that i had any mental health issue to begin with mm -hmm. yeah. so it was sort of uh, finding my way in the wilderness for a, for a large span of 26 years. I mean, hear that again, 26 years. Uh, why this is, uh, you know, this is significant because it also points out at the sheer lack of awareness uh, around mental health in India. And even more accentuated if you go back by around the two, three decades, you know, when sure. at the period we are talking about you know, in the late 70s and early 80s. Yeah. So I was a 14 year old and 
that was the first time when i encountered a very severe phase of depression and this spell would last for around 6 months or 7 months and it was nobody noticed what was happening except me and i even i couldn't identify it as depression because we didn't understand what depression was back then all i could have uh, gauge was that somehow i felt that i was my world was falling apart and i couldn't make sense of what was happening to me right so neither did i get any attention for depression or for any other condition uh, that i was suffering from you know at that point of time i had similar episodes down the line uh, at 17 when i was in college in my first year uh, subsequently when i joined an enterprise which was a family enterprise and this is the surprising part despite the spells being pretty severe debilitating and nobody really spotting the uh, issues you know mm-hmm. so as it often so, uh, so often happens with bipolar disorder uh, you know diagnosis first happens when the uh, you know the episode gets really really out of hand and mania typically is something which is difficult for somebody to overlook yeah, yeah. so i also i might have had many episodes of hypomania prior to that my full blown manic episode happened in 2003 for the first time it must have been there for a very long period before then and it had come to a level of high degree of escalation leading to a lot of uh, you know disruption in the way i was functioning my thought processes and my hawkeyed sister at that time noticed that uh, there was something really really wrong with me and i needed professional attention and as happens with people in that uh, frame of mind i was in denial in fact i claimed that uh, my, my family needed attention it wasn't me i was yeah. a genius with all the <laughs> solutions available absolutely yeah. totally right? know that <laughs> and i was taken to a psychologist and that's where the first uh, diagnosis i mean not even the diagnosis so she says that you have come to the wrong professional this guy needs to be taken immediately to a psychiatrist you know noticing the severity of my condition sure and straight away i was rushed to a psychiatrist and from there to a hospital so so this is how the journey transpired from the age of 14 to 40 uh, and uh, and uh, the, the initial diagnosis at that time was manic depressive illness as bipolar disorder was named uh, you know termed uh, clinically way back sure. then you know in the early 2000s right uh, I was a successful entrepreneur back then. Uh, in fact, I was I was at the pinnacle of my career. Uh, it was a 14-year-old uh, enterprise in the field of audiovisual equipment rentals, mm-hmm. and this came at uh, as an absolute shock to me. Uh, the, the first thought that struck me when I was lying in the bed at hospital was that now I am mentally ill, mm-hmm. and that was how overwhelming it was, Nikhil. Yeah. because the whole stigma around mental illness was so so much you know so the, the immediate thoughts were very negative and, uh, and sort of crushing how would peers look at me how would family look at me the extended relatives friends so on you know, right right it led to such a situation that i had to wind up my successful enterprise because i had lost all motivation for uh, you know in running it so you know, to cut a long story short it was a, you know from there on it was a struggle of say around another 6 7 years at least before i found a semblance of stability right with the combination of um, you know uh, the backing of treatment from a very good psychiatrist therapy and my own self discipline uh, i found my way back again to good health again yeah that's that's incredible um I did want to understand a little bit because you mentioned uh, I like the phrase you used Hawkeye sister. Um yeah. and I want to understand the impact that family plays in the mental health journey. I myself can tell you that you know I've struggled with bipolar disorder. Uh, I received my diagnosis uh, at the age of 40 so about 6 years ago. Um but it was something that I struggled with the symptoms for quite a number of years for uh, more than 2 decades and I had family that uh I think initially they they it was something I I don't know they they either were aware of it and didn't want to acknowledge it or they they just they couldn't see it. 
uh, it was really my wife who could see the, you know, the trend lines, you know, if you talk about financials, yeah. uh, she could see the trend lines, not just the, the little data points. She could see that there were times where I would have elevated moods and be very creative and very high energy. And then there would be times where I would just not be able to get out of bed. Um, and so she was the one who, even though we went through a very acrimonious separation, she was the one who did force me to uh, face my demons and um, get treatment. So I'm bringing that up because it's so cr the the role of family is so important because you really need people who can understand the entire person, not just sort of what the patient is presenting with at the time of uh, their appointment. Um, so. I want to understand in your experience and also just in India in general, um, how does family play into mental health uh, in, in with regards to India specifically? And I asked that question also because India and the US have a lot of differences, obviously. And I'd say the one of the primary ones is just the role of family in that, as you and I talked about before, uh, you know, families are very close knit in India and a lot of times, uh, you know, there's people who go off on their own in the US, whereas they're very close knit in India. And so they can, that can either be good in that, you know, it, there's more awareness, but they can also be bad because there's a need to keep up appearances. So can you shed a little bit of light of sort of what the role of family plays in uh, in mental sure. health in India, good and bad in your experience? Sure. In fact, Nikhil, our community gives us a ringside view of uh, the scenario, you know, mm -hmm. because in a, uh, the community doesn't comprise only of people living with mental health conditions, but their family carers also in many cases. Sure. So we understand their viewpoints and challenges as well. So, so a very relevant point that the structure of family in India is entirely different and especially mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes to caregiving uh, for a person with uh, severe mental health conditions, Nikhil. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, I would go on to uh, add and say uh, that we really don't have a primary health care model for uh, mental health. We can, uh, I would uh, even go further on to say that, that the family uh, de facto becomes the primary health care center for the person uh, living mm -hmm. with mental mm -hmm. conditions. All right. So, so in fact, many times the diagnosis is initiated from there. If not diagnosis, at least alerting the professional about the you know signs of uh, abnormal behavior or thought patterns or things like that. Secondly, the attachment is much more uh, in Indian families, sure. um, where uh, everybody is very emotionally close knit, where. Uh, you know, it's not that peop uh, people would be considered at, as burdens typically uh, when there is uh, something like this, uh, which is a challenge for now, even the family carers. It is a challenge. Let's accept sure. that. You know, right. Yeah. So by and large, uh, the atmosphere is uh, very supportive, even in terms of financials. Yeah. So we know of people who are not able to earn a livelihood and there are parents who uh, parents who, and siblings who rally around such persons. So I think the, the support system is not only extending to the mental health support part of it, but in a more generalized way, which makes a meaningful difference to the life path of that person. On the other hand, sometimes it can be stifling also for the person. Sure, you sure. Will understand that because and although, you know, the material stop support might be coming in, what might not be coming in would be, you know, that emotional connect, you know, that understanding because of the lack of awareness, the lack right. of sensitization towards these issues. Uh, so, so instead of uh, sort of creating a nurturing atmosphere, it, uh, inadvertently what happens is it creates a toxic atmosphere for the person living with such challenges, trivialization of, uh, you know, certain uh, day to day issues that we face, you would know that too well, Nikhil, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Or something I mean, else, I guess calling a person lazy or you're not trying right. hard enough. I'm, I'm sure that you can work to uh, sort of motivate the person and to sort of, you know, get the person going, but it might uh, sort of also backfire. Think, you know, right? right. And then also the identity is so intertwined with family members, because I think a lot of their every day is spent together, you know, for dinner, for breakfast, you know, there's, then obviously they go to work and then come back. And so there's always that sense of, oh, if, you know, if, if uh, something's wrong with Sanjay, 
then there's something wrong with with me too and so there's this desire to sort of push it under the rug and it's that old mantra out of sight out of mind so um i i was just curious to, have you found that to be the case as well is that there a lot of denial because of the reflection denial, on the very much so the very much so uh and in fact you mentioned a little bit about uh you know what lack of awareness does uh, you know the kind of approaches might have be might be a little different in the western context and in the developed world uh, and what uh, countries like in south asia typically india face because the, when it comes to denial initially all attempts would be to sort of try other approaches except the mm -hmm. one which is tried and trusted and which will really work unfortunately Absolutely. yeah yeah so, tell so, us a little bit more about some of those approaches because yeah. obviously in india there's a lot of spirituality it's a beautiful yeah. tapestry of uh spiritual faiths not just hinduism that's the predominant one but buddhism jainism sikhism all you know it's a, it's i always like to say it's a beautiful tapestry of cultures but tell tell us a little bit more about some of those uh you know non medicinal approaches that are practiced yeah. in india for good, for better or worse so, so i grew up in a joint family as i uh, you know my parents were separated when i was uh, just 5 and mm. i was brought up by my maternal uncle and my maternal grandparents and our family had a lot of you know uh, that uh, deep rooted uh, spiritual sort of uh, upbringing and those mm. uh, beliefs which came, uh, came along with it so the the initial period when i was showing some signs of strife mm -hmm. uh, so the first a quick fix was to try to get me to a tantric you know to find out what's mm -hmm. wrong with this guy so the initial thought was there was something wrong with needed to be fixed you know at a spiritual level you know mm -hmm. rather than look at any possible clinical solutions biochemical yeah. bio biochemical right. issues so, yeah so i remember so i remember uh, me being taken to temples also you know uh, and behind my back people uh, discussions happening you know astrologers are being consulted about mm. uh, what could be the fix for me and i don't blame the, you know blame these people at all you know all right. this was done with the, the it was good intentions good intentions good intention, was, good intention yeah. was right it was only that they weren't aware the methods were, were totally inappropriate you know at that sure. time yeah. so if we go back to the uh, you know late 70s and early 80s that's what uh, and we were in a very small village at of wasi mm -hmm. you know, back then now wasi is a sort of a large town it wasn't back then so mm -hmm. it, it was like an island cut off from the rest of the world and uh, uh, that is like why a, the, like uh, a microcosm sort of yeah. even uh, even more uh, magnified than it would be mm -hmm. in a large metro city like mumbai or uh, the delhi or somewhere else yeah yeah so what has to put these things in context but these uh, sort of uh, childhood sort of inputs did leave a long uh, you know long lasting impact on my psyche Sure. and in a positive way i will say yeah so i am myself a uh, you know deep believer in uh, in god in a higher power and i do believe that uh, god has played a major role in my recovery because at the time when i was down and out when inspiration was lacking belief was lacking there was some external input coming into me which was telling me to hang in there and sort of yeah. uh, you know keep at it keep trying right you'll yeah. get through this yeah so so to this uh, to this date i remain a deeply spiritual person and i think the, the, besides families it's also the persons themselves uh, themselves also who have these kind of experiences and another aspect about bipolar disorder especially is sometimes our experiences and sort of uh, uh, what would you say the way we look at spirituality could be a bit exaggerated and dramatized mm -hmm. <laughs> and due to the sort of uh, cognitive distortions we could face at uh, you know particularly vulnerable moments and it happened to um, sure. me as well Yeah, yeah. Um I I really love for you I know all about it. I mean, I I could probably but I would love for you to tell everybody about uh bipolar India sort of how that journey evolved. My understanding is that you started looking to writing as a creative outlet and then I think it attracted the attention of some folks and then sort of snowballed into this big community and this portal. But if you could walk us through a little bit about that sort of the the uh ev the genesis and the evolution of bipolar india oh sure the, uh, that is an organization which i am very passionate about firstly mm -hmm. 
Uh, so uh, I took to writing around 2011-12. Uh, at that time, my enterprise had just been shut down a, a few years before the, uh, that, and uh, I was, uh, you know, dabbling with life insurance for a, around seven eight years. I'm successful at that also, and somehow I felt my heart wasn't at what I was doing. And I needed some your know, creative expression. Took to writing. I became a blogger, a pretty successful one at that also. And one of my blog posts was, uh, it was titled "At the Crossroads of Life," mm. and that was my coming out of a story of living with bipolar disorder and uh, you know, uh, touching uh, recovery. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that attracted a lot of attention because this was uh, way back in 2012. That's exactly a decade before, uh, uh, a decade earlier mm -hmm. to this. And right. where where stories of opening up were the rarest of rare cases happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially for conditions which were as severe as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, it would it would right. be very rare, I would say. And a mentor friend of mine, Punit Bhatnagar, who himself is a published author and a renowned mm -hmm. writer, read my writing. This particular post and some other stuff came across and met me. Uh, he understood, uh, tried to understand what, where I was coming from, and what is that I needed to, wanted to con communicate to uh, society, mm -hmm. and he felt that this needed to be take, taken to one step further than mm -hmm. just a blog or just a group on Facebook or something. Right. Therefore, even the coinage of the term bipolar India was his brainwave. Right. A great Maybe name. You credit to him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the vision that there was a need for a community in that era of darkness where there was no conversation happening at all. All right. Right. So imagine a guy with no direct connect with mental health coming in and telling me, look, there, there is a dire need for this to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, a Mr. Bhatnagar, he had a, because you mentioned, yeah, he's a, uh, as, he's like branding expert or storyteller, That's but right. he also has, he also has uh, a lot of expertise and exposure in mental health or he, he uh, has so, no, very little exposure to mental okay. health okay okay only ability to grasp what is possible you know he is a oh, visionary. sure sure visionary I, yeah I don't yeah. Know, yeah he has this ability to knack uh, the, the knack to find out what is this uh, what uh, what is this person's uh, you know specific ability which would uh, click big time what is mm -hmm. the need of society at large and how to connect the dots. You know? I see, I see. And that it's not only in my case, it's happened elsewhere also. I've noticed big successes and breakthroughs happening. So yeah. he, in fact, registered the domain name for me uh, and uh, created a, a dummy website for me to sort of operate from. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started rolling. So in May 2013, our first uh, blog uh, post on the site uh, came up. Initially, the thought was to just create awareness because even that was a big necessity. No questions about it, right? Right, right. So, so the objective was to create awareness around what bipolar disorder was, more, more, uh, more people to engage with us, to sort of uh, initiate conversations. Even mm -hmm. that didn't happen initially to our satisfaction. In fact, most of the traffic we got was from the US and the Europe, which was counterproductive. Yeah, I, I think I read that, yeah. Adequate awareness. So, <laughs> It took a couple of years for the. Was it mostly case. folks? Was it mostly folks like myself who like were in the states growing up and they were struggling with the cultural aspect of it and they wanted to get some insight in that? Is that kind of what the the flavor of the uh, most of the pe people who were interested in it at the time? Very true. Very mm -hmm. true. And so, so, but that wasn't meeting our objectives, was it? I mean, sure. we needed to connect with our home audience where there was lack right. of them. So after a couple of years, with constant effort, to uh, sort of publicizing this on social media, gradually we, we found, uh, created a base. And the most encouraging part was conversations began happening in the form of comments and discussions mm -hmm. on the platform itself. And yeah. the, the most heartwarming part was people opening up, mm -hmm. which was a big victory way back then. If you can you know, look at it in perspective. Opening up yeah. about uh, mental health conditions in public domain uh, takes uh, some doing, and that uh, that breakthrough was achieved in uh, say around in the period of 2015 uh, or so thereabouts. Yeah. And 
so essentially at that time we are still a, 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 a online you know community based mainly on the portal and then some uh, interaction happening on social media mm-hmm. the breakthrough happened when 5 years ago we started our offline peer support meets mm-hmm. you know in mumbai so what began as a uh, meet one uh, one fine sunday in the morning uh, in a, uh, in a suburb of mumbai became a monthly affair since then all right and then that mushroom to a few other cities in uh, india as well right and we have been doing uh, the, uh, the offline conferences as well the world bipolar day conventions since 2016 on uh, march 30th as you know that's when the world bipolar day falls right right so we are the first entity to hold a world bipolar day conference in india of that, on that scale so it was a pan india conference with uh, participants coming in from all uh, the far corners of the country mm-hmm. that set us um, uh, you know of uh, set us rolling and the community kept uh, growing in size and what we realized is that in between the meets then the people were left without any anybody uh, to hand hold them or to sort of support them in their hard to anybody yeah so okay. we uh, we connected everybody through a telegram based uh, group you know right mm-hmm. and this is how our community expanded to a pan india base and now we have got some 600 members across uh, various groups you know with the diverse and, and what we can the entire with, country then uh, what began with bipolar disorder as the core uh, issue that we would be discussing has now expanded to uh, generally all mental health conditions so it is not limited to bipolar disorder anymore but although because of um, you know the branding which has happened over the years primarily the people driven to our community remain those with uh, you know bipolar disorder bipolar disorder yeah uh, yeah and uh, Uh, by the way now our community uh, what was founded in 2013 so uh, we'll be completing our ninth year now in may and our, <clears throat> our organization is in the process of being registered as a charitable trust so we'll be a mm. non-profit uh, uh, with the recognition to you know uh, scale up our activities increase our outreach to uh, our community as well nikhil and in that direction uh, let me add something here sure uh, bipolar india in august 2020 has launched an initiative which is a path breathing a breaking in its approach it's a, it's a separate division of its uh, uh, you know in a totally different direction mm-hmm. which is focused on livelihoods for persons with mental illness mm. okay i think this is something which is very relevant when you compare india and the us where india doesn't have the social support that uh, structure that in, uh, us offers where it right. comes to like you know financial sustenance of a person and uh, extended to families of course right yeah so, so that's so the, le- is that let, let's walk together is that what that is or that's something else that is right it's known as okay. letswalktogether.org and uh, we have been um, uh, you know very fortunate to elicit the support of the finest minds in india from the mental health and policy space and uh, organizations also right That's like great. mariwala health foundation center for mental health law and policy and manorathi to begin with yeah mm-hmm. and we are you partnering with any organizations in other countries or is it primarily just uh, focused in india and are there any plans maybe down the road to sort of extend this beyond uh, the borders of india Oh sure in the future uh, we will be looking at uh, expand uh, you know expanding our ways to because i don't think mental health is limited to boundaries of a region or a nation Ooh, at all yeah. i mean there is so much overlap happening uh, uh, in this uh, sphere uh, we would be uh, looking at uh, you know joining hands with um, uh, organizations uh, in other places uh, and other yeah. nations as well uh, for yeah. instance we did have an informal tie up with uh, uh the minds foundation uh, which is based again in the us mm-hmm. us mm-hmm. and india it has got a base this is, in what's india. the name of the organization again the minds foundation minds okay are you familiar okay. with nami okay. that that's another one that's big in the us i'd be interested uh, are you familiar with nami it's the national of course. alliance yes. yeah 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 of course yeah. very much so yeah cuz i, I re- yeah no I, i i bring that up because as we talked about earlier i think the cultural implications are so strong with mental illness and 
I think it would be very helpful for people who are suffering from it or have uh, loved ones to understand what the approach is in different countries, to understand the, you know, the learnings, the failings and adapt because there's so many things, especially, and I, and I always go back to with India, there's so much in the culture about meditation and mindfulness, pranayam, you talk about, you know, nutrition, Ayurvedic. Can you, um, can you touch on a little bit of that, like in terms of your practice? Because uh, I think you had mentioned some of the things that I just talked about. But um, the other thing we were talking about earlier was uh, it's almost like with maintaining your mental health, it's like uh, they talk about a well-balanced diet, right? You can't just do meditate. You can't just do meditation. Uh, you can't just do talk therapy. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of what your uh, your idea of a, of a well-balanced mental health diet would be uh, to, to help with your recovery and for others? Uh, prior to that, let me touch upon also the holistic approach that I adopted to definitely, recover. yeah. Uh, because uh, I think you are aware that I have lived with critical and uh, very, very severe asthma, mm -hmm. which was mm -hmm. life threatening on several locations. Yeah, right. So I've been admitted to intensive care in, you know, near death kind of situations that, wow. so that cool. severe. And so, so my holistic approach actually stems from my, uh, you know, need for recovery from asthma. Yeah, sure. Much better. Sure. So it pre uh, preceded uh, bipolar disorder, and uh, when since we are talking about that, uh, I'm uh, touching about some other point. But asthma was first diagnosed with four, uh, at age 14, and bipolar disorder was diagnosed at 40. Whereas onset was very much at the similar time frame. Yeah. Right? yeah. So this is another glaring example of how physical health. Uh, gets attention. Physical health was prioritized and mental health was deprioritized. Yeah, right. So that was uh, all the uh, we have drifted from the point. But so it started from there because my health get uh, kept on getting worse and worse. And a lot of uh, doctors had written uh, uh, me off as a, you know, a case of no return. There was no uh, hope for me until I found a phenomenal doctor in Dr. Nefarkar. And his mantra is something that, uh, you know, and I will never forget that you have to come to me in a critical phase, but I'll ensure that I'll at least bring you to a state of stability within the next year or so. Mm -hmm. And he said, what he said to me was very powerful. My meds are not going to heal you. What will heal you is your discipline. Mm, absolutely. Right. Yeah. And he started, uh, that is where my journey with yoga, uh, you know, exercise, uh, diet, uh, discipline, uh, pranayam, all these things were began way back then. This would have been, I think, 30 years back. Let's go back mm -hmm. 30 years of time. And so the initial uh, path of discipline wasn't anything to do with bipolar disorder. It began as a template for recovery from bio, uh, asthma. Mm, and okay. within six months, from uh, you know very severe stage, I was a miraculous turnaround case, and which astonished even my doctor. Mm. That's great. So, so when I was um, down in the dumps with bipolar disorder, in fact, this became my sort of, you know, uh, straw to clutch onto. And, you know, this, this was something gave, which gave me hope. Mm -hmm. If I could come out of that mess, which, I, you know, asthma was in, you know, at that point, particular point of time, it was like a hopeless situation for me. And if I could recover from there and uh, live a full life uh, in physical terms, what was stopping me from doing that for bipolar disorder as well? Yeah. Right? So, so I continued doing my pranayam sessions and all that. So, in fact, my typical day is like 45 uh, in the mornings. It begins with 45 minutes of pranayam and uh, other stretching exercises. Then a 45 minutes to a, one hour of a workout. Mm. And then I head into my day, right? Yeah. yeah. And then you came up, okay, come to that diet part, which is something which is so important as well. And which is very rarely addressed. So, so yeah. it's important you bring bring it up here, Nikhil. Uh, so sure, diet plays a very important role. And um, again, I had the advantage because for asthma, there are a lot of no-nos for me. You know, there's some things sure. I can't do. Right? You would be aware about those things. So I had consulted a, a certified nutritionist, and a diet was customized uh, after my blood reports were sought. You know, it was uh, they sort of uh, uh, all my medical uh, 
comorbidities were taken into account and then mm-hmm. the diet was designed for me so essentially it is not too complex not too fancy uh, because of my varied conditions there are some uh, vitamin uh, vitamin deficiencies which need supplementation for sure that is uh, going in omega 3 supplements and uh, by the way i am a vegetarian my only indulgence is eggs <laughs> all right mm-hmm. yeah Mm-hmm. because uh, my spiritual beliefs uh, i am a vegetarian so that also uh, uh, leads to a little bit of uh, you know uh, imbalance in uh, the uh, nutrients that the body sure. needs right? is that something have you been a lifelong vegetarian or is that something that you I, changed i know i switched to being a vegetarian uh, in 2008 okay okay 2008. and did you notice that helped uh, the health uh, health issues or uh, No, I wouldn't say so nothing mm-hmm. dramatic okay. uh, uh, no no I would I wouldn't say that is uh, that was for my own uh, sort of uh, conviction spiritual and moral convic- ethical conviction also about yeah. cruelty to animals uh, less to do with on health grounds yeah okay so uh, so self made choice you can say <laughs> that wasn't something right. that was advised to me but what I do is I ensure that my macros are balanced the, the, you know the right component of protein fat carbs veggies going in supplemented by eggs for the protein and uh, mm-hmm. the, so on you know so uh, so for the last decade my we- uh, weight is the same weight you know i am at my ideal uh, bmi ideal bmi Great. you know because there is so much of uh, complaining happening around bipolar medications uh, leading to weight gain or uh, whatever right yeah but mm-hmm. i feel uh, we can't deny that right many of the medications do cause these kind of issues uh, but yeah. if provided we uh, lean in put in that effort there is a possibility to overcome those kind of uh, you know issues so as well. mm-hmm. yeah yeah so can we step back a little i want to talk uh, we touched on it a little bit but i want to dive in a little bit more um what is your view of mental health in india uh currently and you know since you were diagnosed because i th- i think we had talked earlier about how you know when you were younger there was more of an emphasis on curing spiritual imbalances uh, as opposed to really delving into uh the crux of the issue with mental health yeah. can you tell me a little bit about actually maybe even going back further to you know back when you were first had your manic episode which was uh you know when you were 14 or when you you know throughout that time if you could tell me sort of how uh the state of mental health in india has evolved uh over time and where you see it going yeah. well uh, definitely awareness has uh, risen dramatically i mean if i trace my journey way back to my uh what it was uh, 45 years back when the first symptoms came up to what it is today there is a dramatic mm-hmm. change there's no question about it uh there is what has changed uh, massively uh, helped uh, bring about change massively is the internet i believe mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that provides access to information to anybody looking for it right so you yeah. just google up sing, uh, symptoms and then you come to come across some complex terms and then you try to uh, uh, you know investigate further and then you realize that what you need to do is to go to a psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist so on right yeah that wasn't happening when uh, i i had my symptoms first so you can yeah. uh, imagine the difference the internet itself brought on right yeah for sure Today, yeah. You, uh, you are you are in the dark about anything you just uh, uh, go to search and to sort of uh, try to find a solution for it or you raise a question in some community or the other of which you are a part of right mm-hmm. second thing is conversations are happening nikhil sure that is massive right again social media and the internet has uh, uh, allowed that to happen right because conventional media mass media doesn't really encourage uh, voices from the you know common man sort of uh, voices to uh, come into right mind. so celebrities suffering with bipolar disorder or depression or something they'll splash <laughs> the, the headlines will be splashed all over the place but right. uh, people like you and me don't make the headlines right so right. this is what also has changed um so social media has made access to information allowed us to hold conversations to with like minded people to access communities which can support us that is really? a big change third thing is which has happened is uh somehow there is a gradual shift 
uh, even mass media is taking up uh, you know realizing that, that they have a, a, a role of uh, role uh, to, uh, role of responsibility to create the necessary awareness mm-hmm. and we do see a glimmer of hope also coming in there in at least in some of the quality publications and uh, media platforms yeah. right so so that is a change that i see and one of the most obvious signs you know and which is an encouraging sign is like people like you like both you and i uh, were diagnosed a full two decades and more later right 26 right. years in my case right so what i see there are many youngsters coming into our community with early diagnosis so i think that is the most stark uh, sort of a indicator that illnesses are being spotted at mu- at a much earlier juncture and mm-hmm. so the gap between onset and diagnosis is narrowing down which is a right. positive thing as well right No I love what you're bringing up about uh, social media because you know in a lot of my discussions I've talked to a lot of mental health professionals uh on these types of podcasts and and videos and um you know I always think of social media and it's always painted with a broad brush as yeah. that it has a destructive impact or that technology because you know everyone is stuck on their phones they're either doom scrolling or they're looking at TikTok But I think it's really important uh to hear your perspective because having gone through these mental health challenges uh in I guess you could call, you could call them the dark ages um of of India during the 70s you said right I mean going through that kind of struggle uh when there is no access to information has got to create so much anxiety and so much it just compounds the issue right And so I think it's really important for people to remember uh that they have this wealth of information at their fingertips and it's just a matter of using it, you know, anything done in uh excess is bad, but anything done in moderation can have myriad benefits. And so I think it's really important uh and I really appreciate you emphasizing the uh you know, the 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 it, taking that glass half full perspective on technology and seeing as how it can be an enabler uh as opposed to a a force of uh, a destructive force so uh and i think that's you know people like people like yourself need to sort of uh, take advantage of that um going more so with the discussion about india um do you feel that legislation uh there's more legislation that's coming out that's helping uh you know move forward the case for mental mental health in india and you know what what is the government in general i guess doing to to support uh to support that development uh, i would say in uh, no uncertain terms whatever is whatever the government is doing whether it whether it is uh, the central government or the state governments who are in charge mm-hmm. of health at the local level uh, it is maybe 1% of what is necessary mm-hmm. let's not mm-hmm. mince words right right, right. right i mean the the size of the, of the problem is an elephant and you are treating an ant right this yeah. is the yeah. the mismatch happening let's i can't be more starker than that uh, firstly the priority you know resource uh, hungry country where we have lack of resources is always uh, physical health issues sure. for instance the pandemic came in so we saw a flood of resources going towards vaccination uh, funding and so on right hospitalization right. expenses and all that so that is always at the top priority level you know because that's the immediate emergency visible. which everybody it's can you know the visible, visible right 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 visible is there and they don't have any choice <clears throat> the governments are forced to act upon it this is the slow burning fire which has been sort of <laughs> been there in existence people know it is there but nobody is mm-hmm. doing anything thing about it right right uh, so so that is the agonizing part so what <clears throat> is being done about uh, mental health in india is a fraction of what it needs to be done yeah so that is one thing <clears throat> you mentioned about the laws in place uh, which empower us right nikhil mm-hmm. uh, so we had the good fortune of having excellent legislation in the form of the mental health care act 2017 mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. it's a ra- radically empowering act and look uh, it's a based on a rights based approach which uh, puts the person with mental illness at the center of policy making yeah so everything mm-hmm. is uh, you know designed with the person with mental illness in the center of uh, you know keeping that person at the center of decision making process yeah and mm-hmm. revolving the entire policy around that 
Now, again, the sad part is, uh, despite having such a phenomenal act in place, which empowers us at multiple levels, yeah, demanding ex, uh, you know, call access to quality healthcare, mental healthcare, uh, irrespective of where I stay, irrespective of my socio-economic background, access mm -hmm. to health insurance, for instance, which uh, in India, mental illness is not covered by uh, health insurance companies, right? Oh, wow. uh, even so are you saying that mental health issues, any mental health therapies are entirely uh, out of pocket? They're not covered at all? Out insurance? of pocket, yes, absolutely. That's horrible. Uh, absolutely That's horrible. out of pocket. So although there have been legislations and, um, you know, subsequent to the act, um, now there is a, you know, uh, lit, uh, you know, litigation pending in the Supreme Court on this very matter, uh, implementation is lacking in this case. Yeah. So 90% yeah. of the pe persons with mental illness would not be getting insurance uh, reimbursals for their claims. So that is a second, uh, you know, glaring flaw. So I mean, I, I can go endlessly about this, but uh, the act has got so much happening in favor of um, uh, families also, because ultimately yeah. the person with the illness is supported by the state. Uh, it takes a load of uh, burden from the uh, families, you know, sure. isn't it? Right? Yeah. Sure. But that's not happening. Secondly, we have the rights with uh, you know, rights for persons with disabilities act uh, 2016. That is also empowering and that also covers mental illness because that is also a psychosocial disability, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right. Similarly, uh, uh, that act also brings in a lot of empowerment for us. Uh, concessions in higher educations for persons with severe disabilities, uh, including mental health conditions, uh, job quotas in the government uh, sector and a PSU uh, public uh, sector company, companies in India and so on. Uh, but still, uh, again, uh, there is so much more, uh, more uh, which could be done in those respects, I feel. Yeah. Do you feel like the stigma, stigmatization of mental health is getting better with time? I think because of efforts of your, you know, yourself, bipolar, and you, do you, or do you feel that stigmatization is still a pretty big problem where people with mental health are sort of regarded as other? Uh, I would say, Nikhil, see, what happens is awareness touches upon only one aspect about mental health and stigma. What mm -hmm. awareness does is brings the problems to the fore. Mm -hmm. Does it change perceptions? That is what is critical, I feel. Right. Stigma is, I think, totally uh, connected to what are the perceptions, right? The stereotypes around mental illness, right? Sure. That sure. this guy is loony, that this guy is undependable, this guy is crazy, is violent. Right. Are these are the stereotypes which come to your mind when you look at mental illness or what? So just being aware of mental illness is not going to solve the problem, I feel, right? Sure. So what we have seen is a shift. You know, from like you called it very appropriately the dark era to the dark ages to yeah, a period yeah. of uh, you know to a uh, space of some degree of awareness but mm -hmm. that is not translating to sensitization sure i think the next sure. step from awareness needs to be sensitization so because then that makes it a human experience you know so although you are aware about a condition how are you going to relate to a person who's living with this condition how are you going right. to engage with the language we use, for instance? Yeah. How important yeah. is language, right? Yeah. For sure. So, so, so you till this date, media, mass media, the way things are de uh, depicted in popular, say, uh, Bollywood cinema, for instance, uh, they are very derogatory to the persons uh, with mental illness, uh, disrespectful, and uh, they uh, perpetuate the you know stereotypes around uh, mental illness. Uh, in yeah. general, what are the uh, the way people react to mental illness? I don't think the shift has been dramatic enough to say that the stigma has uh, you know vanished into thin air. And I'm mm -hmm. connected to people all over the globe who are living with conditions and heading organizations. And I guess it's a bit of the same some everywhere else. It yeah. must, it's a question of the way, uh, you know the level, uh, degrees. Uh, you know, uh, isn't it? Yeah. It could yeah. be a little bit more in one kind of country. It could be a little bit lesser in some other country. We still haven't uh, reached a level where mental health is easily, uh, mental health conditions are easily accepted in society. No, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting because you mentioned about movies and things. I'd like to understand a little bit better because, you know, Bollywood obviously plays such an outsized uh, impact on Indian culture. You know, people, the yeah. film stars are regarded as, as gods, really. But um, 
you know, in the U.S., and that's something that uh, Shelley, my wife, and I are working on, you know, this book and, and, and a movie about sort of telling our story just so that there's less stigma, especially for our demographic. I'd right. like to understand a little bit more about how Bollywood and, you know, the film industry, entertainment industry in general in India, um, has the, how have they been handling portrayals of mental health? Do you feel that it's... How do you feel that's evolved? Has it gotten better or worse, or is it about the same in terms of you know, um, negative portrayals of mental health? There would be the exceptions who are making diligent efforts to, to you know come across authentic portrayals, but that, you know they remain exceptions. By and mm -hmm. large, popular cinema, and that is what is gets carried across to the millions of uh, Indians, yeah? and that is right. where the communication needs to be sensitized, not to the people who are already at a higher degree of awareness, right, Nikhil? Right. So there, there is no improvement at all. In fact, mm. the things uh, the things are horribly out of place, and the level of uh, you know kind of. Uh, uh, derogatory uh, portrayals that happen in the, the cinema are uh, to be seen to be believed. So for mm -hmm. instance, a person with schizophrenia, I mean, his uh, you know, entire criminal background or a violent background would be attributed to his illness, you know, so, mm -hmm. right? Without any disclaimer mm -hmm. or anything in the movie so at any stage to, uh, uh, to point out that this is not the typical sort of a symptom that the illness yeah. brings out. That's just one thing, example I'm citing here, right? Yeah. Even the sort of the behavioral patterns are all exaggerated in the, the, the uh, you know, uh, movies that they're we like have seen. caricatures, basically. Caricature, like and yeah. plus sometimes brings across a very dangerous uh, perspective about what people with mental illness are. Uh, that uh, if I am a person living with bipolar, I am somebody who needs to be feared. So mm -hmm. you can imagine the damage it does, right? <laughs> right? Sure. Sure. So, so this is not a, you know, the awareness that we want for, for sure, right? Yeah. No, because that's what uh, Shelley and I were uh, pondering this this thought of wh what kind of uh, reception would our book and movie get in India because of the uh, the just just how far India has to go. I mean, in terms of their attitudes towards mental health, like you talked about, just it seems like there's still a lot of ignorance. There's still a lot of uh, negative carryover um, opinions and views that need to be addressed, I think, you know, in, in a big way. And that's obviously what, uh, what you guys are doing uh, with Bipolar India. Um, any, uh, were there any, can you talk a little bit more about some of the, uh, you mentioned uh, Mr. Bhatnagar, you mentioned, uh, um, can you talk a little bit more about maybe some other folks that you're, other folks that you're working with in this arena that uh, you know or that you're aligning with to help affect change and also uh, some organizations I think I, I saw this great interview you did with the I think it's the Samabad Foundation is that uh, and then I think there's White Swan maybe if you could talk about you know people and then organizations that you uh, feel have, have really helped the cause sure sure in fact, um, I've been mentored throughout my, uh, my journey with the by stalwarts. And before I go to the people who are currently collaborating with me, I mentioned mm -hmm. about Puneet Patnagar. And right in the US, in Rochester, I had a fantastic mentor in Jennifer Sertle, mm -hmm. who was a coach to me, a strategy uh, you know, designer for me in a crucial part of my journey when Bipolar India was in its recent stage when I was sort of uh, constructing the story for my book. So she helped me create my world, uh, you know, from fresh at that uh, sure. point of time. Dr. Amit Nagpal, who was my uh, branding and uh, storytelling coach, he's been a stellar support for me in the initial phase of uh, my journey. And now when we are sort of firmly established in the mental health space, uh, you know, in the outreach uh, domain, uh, I've been fortunate to be you know, sort of supported by stalwarts such as Amrit Bakshi ji, who is one of the finest uh, uh, mental health, uh, you know, activists in India that you would ever come across. An 80 year old with the energy of a teenager, hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. And who's been in this field for uh, decades and done remarkable work. Uh, Dr. Somitra Pathare of CMHLP, the C Center for Mental Health Law and Policy, uh, who I discussed earlier, uh, they are supporting us in our livelihoods initiative, Nikhil, right? Mm -hmm. He was instrumental in the drafting of the Mental Health Care Act. One of the persons uh, uh, 
in the you know framing of that act mm-hmm. uh, priti shridhar who is the uh, chief executive officer of uh, mariwala health initiative the largest funding organization for mental health uh, non profits in india uh, mm-hmm. and several others uh, tasneem raja of tata trusts uh, all right she heads the mental health vertical there yeah mm-hmm. so uh, puneet patnagar i have already spoken about tanya dat of atmanirbhar chennai uh, who started an initiative for livelihood in her you know her own small way mm-hmm. it, it is not a non profit it's her own family initi- uh, funded initiative you know, by creating retail uh, store space uh, employing such people yeah mm-hmm. so it's a so whole gamut of support that we have been receiving um, mona shor sharma recently has been very supportive us to us mm-hmm. uh, from uh, manorathi.org dr anita mm-hmm. rego who is a psychiatric social worker uh, it's so a, what about and uh, an organizations any one specifics that uh, you guys are either working with or did, that you feel are helping to to uh, further the cause yeah health? sure yeah so sure uh, so mariwala health initiative who we are uh, connected with is uh, so uh, preeti shridhar has an uh, has a massive background earlier prior to joining mariwala health uh, in the hr domain right mm-hmm. human resources mm-hmm. domain so so it is very much relevant to shaping our policies in the field of uh, you know uh, livelihoods because when we approach the corporate sector uh, yeah what are their expectations so it is a two way sort of a, you know dialogue happening right yeah sure sure she's been instrumental in that respect and as such she's been a, a massive supporter of everything i do and uh, bipolar india does similarly right. dr somitra pathare and his team has been helping us in de- designing uh, disability support guidelines for organizations that is uh, a work in progress at the moment so we'll be creating a guideline for uh, any corporate willing to sort of adapt this uh, uh, you know uh, procedures in their uh, workplaces to they are based on the theme of uh, what is reasonable accommodations for persons with mental health conditions sure. right mm-hmm. so if the, i have a mobility problem uh, i will need some uh, sort of an adjustment to be done at my workplace right what happens is in the uh, mental health domain there is no such men- uh, you know because of lack of visibility of the problem there is no adjustment sure. currently right. at least in india i am not aware of the situation overseas but there is no such a uh, clearly defined atmosphere at the or environment at the workplace right right, right. So, so so these are the kind of policies uh, cmhlp is helping us frame um, you know frame up and uh, present to organizations uh, we have a uh, um, some of the finest mentors from within our community who are part of the mm-hmm. organ, uh, you know leadership team because we believe the charity begins at home we need to sure. empower our own community first so mm-hmm. all of are from lived experience background and happen to have uh, you know stellar success backgrounds in their own uh, you know uh, career uh, domains right that's so important to have mentors and positive people that uh, you know you can look to uh, like yourself included who can have healthy happy productive lives despite managing this illness so it's that's that's so vitally important definitely um what's what's next for uh for you for bipolar india sort of wh- where do you see this uh is going from here uh, so, uh once our uh, organization is uh, you know formalized as a charitable trust which is so important uh, in the you know getting things uh, orderly the, getting the credibility that the organization structure brings it uh, brings along with it because at the moment uh, technically it is a one man led organization supported by supported by many without any formal structure to it right mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. would be the first step that should be happening in the next month or so and the completion of that process uh, and then we have got very clear objectives uh, in mind for how we want to uh, you know approach things how to uh, bring about a change in the uh, mental health space the deficiencies mm-hmm. that we see in the system not just lean on uh, with the uh, government but how we ourselves can take the lead in bringing about change right mm-hmm. so th- therefore the, uh, we thought that livelihoods was one is- uh, issue which is going to something that we just cannot wish away yeah right because one has to also realize something like bipolar disorder or many of the other mental health conditions 
typically the onset happens at the age of uh, say 18 20 25 or whatever and then right. it, it can be either lifelong or it would be up to the age of 50 60 80. it it would depend on each person's individual recovery journey mm-hmm. so unless there is support at that uh, you know crucial productive cycle of an individual it robs the individual right. of that opportunity to assimilate in society nikhil yeah right and right. there is a converse side of it it's not only about the need the financial need being engaged productively you would agree uh, would be a big contributor uh, contributor to the person's uh, mental health also you know of course, a positive yeah, factor yeah, yeah. the sense need a of purpose for living what something to do right yeah the sense of self worth being uh, you know the structure that work brings along you know so all these things you know, right so there is yeah. research that uh, backs it that people who are already uh, engaged productively despite their conditions fare so much better than those who, who do not get such opportunities at workplaces right. and like right. right so that is one initiative uh, the other aspect that we would definitely want to touch upon is uh, my own journey has been based on a holistic approach to healing nikhil mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we too want to ensure that uh, anybody wanting to uh, pursue that path uh, gets all the kind of resources uh, at a reasonable cost or if possible at a zero cost when that there is no feasibility to pay the fees right even right. that happens at certain times so for instance we have a panelist with us from the yoga domain who is an expert there oh, we great. have a panelist who coming in she is a gold medalist in nutrition yeah and has got a lot of expertise in how mental health and nutrition are interlinked right yeah so yeah. so to bring in all these elements and to ensure that lives of people become a little bit smoother than they are today right yeah yeah so, so and of course doing a lot of advocacy to ensure that we keep talking about that policies are there but implementation isn't happening i think right. we stakeholders need to sort of uh, put in the maximum uh, effort to get uh, ensure um uh, that uh, this is done you know right mm-hmm. yeah because at the end of the day they affect uh, these uh, the lack of implementation affects us more than anybody else is there anything else you want to cover uh, for the audience uh, sure we will just want to end some uh, something uh, when we feel we are down and out sometimes there is a message of hope coming across from somewhere that is what we hang on to uh, mm-hmm. if you are going through a mental health crisis at this moment or you know somebody in your family or your immediate friends who who are struggling uh more times than not there is a way out of it right uh, all you need to do is seek help from a uh, good competent uh, psychiatrist a good therapist seek and seeking out communities like help also help uh, you know is very beneficial let me add that i think this is mm-hmm. something we need to highlight so i would uh, just like to end this with uh, by saying this nikhil uh when uh, i was a 14 year old i felt absolutely alone absolutely in the dark not having the foggiest of idea of what was happening to me mm-hmm. today we have the opportunity to connect with the outside world we are there's no need to feel that you are absolutely alone in your struggle if you are in a deep stage of mental health struggle or you know somebody who is going through this phase at the moment will wait in your family or in your fr- immediate friends remember that it is possible to overcome uh, mental health conditions no matter how severe they seem at that point of time with the due diligence one can recover from uh, these conditions in most of the cases right and now uh, there is a lot of help uh, available to us in the form of peer support communities just like we offer it to our community and the internet is smashing boundaries so you can reach out to uh, cross country if your local area doesn't give you support you can reach out to some other community which can uh, lend you support and i would just like to add uh, how important the role of community is uh, when it is led by peers you know mm-hmm. uh, when the lived experience comes together stories resonate it creates a powerful force right one stellar example is bipolar india was founded in 2013 it really found its feet in say around 2015 mm-hmm. since then that has been the most stable phase of my life 
so if people feel i have given a lot to the community i have received a lot as well right? sure so the community has nurtured me to this extent and i believe that it has played a huge role in my recovery as well so i am thankful to the people who are, who are part of the whole community you know they make it happen it's not about just me as an individual right yep absolutely yeah. absolutely well thanks so much uh, uh vj it was it was amazing talking to you and i really appreciate uh, all you've done and uh, I would like to add if there's any way uh, how can people get a hold of you and uh, if they are interested in learning more and maybe getting involved with bipolar india and the and the work you're doing well uh, the contact us form on bipolar india uh, that is the easiest way of getting in touch with me uh, mm -hmm. i guess Michael, that's how we connected as well <laughs> if i'm not yeah. mistaken yeah right it's the beauty of the so, internet yeah so bipolarindia.com is our url uh, and on that, we'll be sh uh, shortly updating the information of all our other initiatives uh, linked to the parent uh, entity. Uh, yeah, let's walk together.org and so on and so forth. So, but the, uh, from there on, you will get all the other uh, uh, information related to me, the organization, and how to join our community also if you wish to be a part of uh, the peer support groups that we run. Perfect. Okay, thanks so much, Vijay. This was a, this, a great pleasure uh, talking to you.